All right, Ryan, tell us what's on your radar. Well, it's Josh Gottheimer week, or at least it's Josh Gottheimer's half of a week. So let me cap it off with one of the most legendary Gottheimer stories that has yet to be told publicly. So to refresh, Gottheimer is a right-wing Democrat who represents a district in northern New Jersey. He attempted to blow up Biden's domestic agenda in the House this week, but he fell short. The short version is that he wanted to push through a bipartisan infrastructure bill quickly before voting on the rest of Biden's agenda, while the party as a whole wants to do them all together so that each wing of the party has to rely on the other wing to get what it wants. So there's either mutually assured success or mutually assured destruction. And Gottheimer was gunning for destruction. For now, he lost. So. Gottheimer was first elected in 2016, and not long after being sworn in, in January 2017, he was invited to the 80th birthday party for a senior member of his state's delegation, Representative Bill Pascrell. The region Pascrell represents abuts Gottheimer's, but couldn't be more socioeconomically different, containing the working class city of Patterson and a stretch of the Jersey Shore. Pascrell was hosting the party at a favorite hometown bar in Patterson, something of, a, something of a dive on the outskirts of town called Duffy's Tavern. Patterson wasn't the type of area where Gottheimer spent much time, but it wasn't an actively dangerous spot. Not only was it a regular haunt of the local congressman, it was owned by Terry Duffy, a town freeholder, the state's version of a city councilor. Gottheimer agreed to brave the journey to Patterson to celebrate his colleague, but when he arrived, it was clear he'd taken a confounding set of precautions. Gottheimer was accompanied by an off-duty police officer and showed an unusual amount of bulk under his shirt. Are you wearing a bulletproof vest? Pascrell asked his freshman colleague. Gottheimer acknowledged that he was, in fact, wearing a flak jacket, but he went on to say, by way of explanation, that he had been doing a ride along earlier with the officer and had worn the vest as a result. The explanation, even were it true, failed to explain why he was still wearing the vest at the party. So a round of heckling and wisecracking ensued, drawing the attention of Terry Duffy. The freeholder was not amused. He threw Gottheimer out of his bar. So now Gottheimer's foray into Democratic caucus politics this week wasn't much better thought out, and it didn't end much differently than his foray into Patterson. While Gottheimer may have won a face-saving victory by getting a date certain for a vote, his win didn't change the underlying dynamic that gave progressives leverage in the first place. Pelosi can promise Gottheimer a vote, and she might even deliver on it, but she can't promise enough votes to pass the bill. Democrats in the Congressional Progressive Caucus, the CPC, have pledged to oppose the infrastructure bill if reconciliation isn't ready, and many of them reiterated those promises on Tuesday, even as members of Congress filtered off the House floor, having just approved the procedural motion that Gottheimer wanted, 220 to 212. Following the vote, the Chamber of Commerce, an ally of no labels and Gottheimer during the fight, applauded the crew for having, quote, decoupled infrastructure from reconciliation by winning the promise of a vote. Liz Morrison, co-director of No Labels, echoed that sentiment in a memo that the group circulated privately to allies, one of which sent it to yours truly. So wrote Morrison, Speaker Pelosi has now guaranteed a vote on the bipartisan infrastructure bill by no later than September 27th. This means the infrastructure bill will likely be voted on first and before any vote to pass a reconciliation bill. This is not what Pelosi wanted, as both she and the Progressive Caucus had previously insisted that the Senate vote to approve the full reconciliation bill before the Speaker would bring the infrastructure bill to the floor. The unbreakable nine have now broken this link, as Pelosi can no longer use the infrastructure bill as leverage to force Democratic moderates to vote for a reconciliation bill, Morrison continued. It will now rise or fall on its own merits. This is why Politico Playbook, which is the most read political newsletter in D.C., just wrote that Pelosi grossly underestimated the nine and that they planted a flag in the ground for the fights to come. But the nine had to give something up, too. They agreed to vote yes on the budget resolution that authorizes debate to begin on reconciliation. This is essentially the same thing all 50 Senate Democrats did a few weeks ago. It is just a vote to begin debate, and in the end, any of the nine can still vote against a final reconciliation bill. So have the nine really decoupled the two measures? If progressives still have the votes to sink the infrastructure bill without the accompanying reconciliation package, then the bills are not decoupled. 
That's not a fundamentally different dynamic than prevailed last week. I asked Representative Cori Bush if the deal changed her thinking or whether she was still a no unless the whole deal was done. She said, quote, it has to be both. They have to be together. Representative Ilhan Omar, the whip for the CPC, told me that the CPC's insistence on coupling the two measures has not changed. Representatives Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Rashida Tlaib, Mark Pocan all said the same thing. When I, when I posted those tidbits on Twitter, Pocan, former chair of the CPC, chided me, saying lots of other progressives would vote no, too. Representative Henry Cuellar, a Democrat from Texas, one of the, quote, unbreakable nine, told me he wasn't worried about progressives voting down the infrastructure bill on September 27th because he expected to pick up Republican votes. Quote, we've got at least 10, 12 Republicans, he told me. And the progressives will fall in line, he added. Quote, they're going to support the president. I feel very confident, unquote. Gottheimer had felt equally confident. In an interview with The Atlantic, he had explained that his move was an attempt to fulfill Biden's agenda and that the White House was supportive of the effort. Asked by reporters if that was the case, White House spokesperson Andrew Bates said simply, no. And so I wanted to uh, quote that entire piece from Morrison of, of No Labels because throughout this entire process, No Labels, which is a dark money group funded by a lot of hedge fund and private equity billionaires, had insisted that all they really wanted was to get shovels in the ground as quickly as possible. This wasn't about reconciliation. It's not about blowing up the, well, it's not about blowing up the child care tax credit. It's not about stopping carried interest uh, taxes from going up. It's really just about infrastructure and getting it out as fast as possible. Now in their internal memo, we see that no, in fact, the entire thing was about trying to decouple these, trying to take leverage away from progressives so that they could go after the reconciliation package. Uh, Kim, do you think that it being, it being now known that this was the entire point of their effort the whole way through will hurt them a bit when they come around again in a month and try to take it down? Yeah, I think so. I think that they're going to be falling on their swords a little bit on this one. Um, I, I think they're underestimating just simply how popular a lot of the policies are that are in this larger package. Uh, people want these, they want these these things that are going to be helping their children, helping their families. And so I do think that they're underestimating the power of that. I, I don't think people care. I mean, look, infrastructure is really important, right? We do need new roads. We need, uh, you know, all of these bridges and whatnot. But I think people care more about how are they going to get through day to day. And this other larger package gives them some of that comfort and some of that cushion. Um, so I think it's really interesting that they're sort of like, oh, no, we really just want shovels in the ground. And that's not really clearly what's going on here. But they're also really underestimating the power of this progressive caucus. That's, I think, 100 members strong. Right. Yeah. So they're definitely going to be pushing this through together. And I think these guys might have used their political leverage a little too soon. Yeah, I, I think so. But, but Alyssa, I wanted to turn to the most important point here. Uh, you formerly worked for the, the Pentagon. You probably had to don a flak jacket once or twice while over there. Did you ever think <laughs> about uh, wearing one to a bar? I, I just I was trying not to laugh <laughs> off camera during this. So my family is also from close to Patterson. I, as a little girl, spent time in Patterson. I've not been to Duffy's, but I can tell you, no, I would not wear a flak jacket <laughs> in suburban New Jersey. But I think that shows you just a little bit about um, our old friend Josh Gottheimer. I would note this, too. I think that you um, I'm amending some predictions I made earlier um, in this program a few days back. I actually am um, starting to think that the 10 to 12 Republicans won't necessarily hold on the ultimate vo vote, which is why Pelosi will, in fact, need progressives. And I say this because the same way that we're seeing progressives on air trying to push the moderates to support this package, you're seeing conservative outside groups really putting pressure on moderate Republicans to not support this package. And going into the midterms, you know, nobody wants to be have ads on air saying you supported President Biden's agenda if you're in a Republican district. So I could see that 10 to 12 number on the Republican side probably being cut in half uh, by the September date. So Pelosi's smart to try to hold on to the progressives in her caucus. I think that's her best path to victory. Yeah, and I, I thought that was fascinating from Cuellar when he when he when he actually put a number on it because they've you know they've talked in the past about about, well, we'll have Republican support. Don't worry about it. But for him to say that they'd have, at least, he said, at least 10 to 12, 
That's a pretty pitiful number, and, and that's what he's claiming. And I think you're right that with all of the pressure on them, there was a vote last night on the, on the John Lewis Act, which, which only has kind of the, the least controversial voting rights uh, uh, elements, that, which got you know, 400 plus votes back in what, 2007 or whenever the last time it went through, uh, zero Republican votes. On you know on the John on the John Lewis Act last night, and so I think that if if Cuellar is overestimating the amount of Republican support, ten to twelve, then that means progressives only need to only need to find like the people that I named pretty much to be able to take it down. And here and and here's how the dynamic changes: if the media understands that this September twenty seventh date. Is a nothing burger because it's, if it's a procedural vote, if if Pelosi puts it up, it's going down. It's a foreordained, uh, it, you know, it's foreordained. The, the the media only wants to cover things that are unpredictable. If it's predictable that this sucker is just going down, if there's no reconciliation bill with it, then then it, then it's not even a real fight, and it doesn't even get much coverage. Exactly. And I would just reiterate, the appetite for bipartisanship really wanes ahead of midterm. So again, that number could be in half. Nobody wants to be on the road touting that they supported Biden's you know, chief domestic accomplishment if you're a Republican. Right. Kim, looking forward to your radar up next.